All right, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for attending uh, and welcome to the Office of Public School Construction's presentation on the full day kindergarten facilities grant program. Today, December 17th, 2018, uh, we will provide an overview of the program and program eligibility, go through the application process and discuss the funding order determination and requirements for fund release and program reporting. Before we begin, uh, I would like to advise that those live in attendance, um, there are restroom facilities immediately upon exit uh, to the left or also across the atrium um, by the elevators. Uh, emergency exiting can be found on either side of the stage as well as um, where the entrance to the auditorium. Uh, once outside, follow the exit signs uh, to get out of the building. Uh, today's presentation will be facilitated by the program team members. Uh, my name is Joshua Potter. I am the program supervisor. I'm also joined with the program project managers, uh, Alexandra Ruloba and Lindsay Gordon. Uh, this presentation and the webcast of this event will be posted on the OPSC's website. Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra Riloba and I'm gonna be giving a brief overview of the whole program. So the full day kindergarten facilities grant program was established uh, by 18, Assembly Bill 1808 and it was signed by the governor on June 27th, 2018. The program provides one-time grants to increase the number of full-day kindergarten classrooms by either constructing new school facilities or retrofitting existing school facilities. The program allows for funding for existing kindergarten pupils and, but not prospective kindergarten pupils, also known as growth. Please note that trans transitional kindergarten or TK enrollment will be included when calculating overall kindergarten enrollment for the project. However, funding cannot be provided solely to separate TK and kinder students into separate classrooms. Applications will only be accepted during specified funding rounds. So application submittal funding rounds. Assembly Bill 1808 appropriated 100 million out of the general fund to the state allocation board for this program. Statute authorizes the Department of General Services to charge administrative fees up to 2.5% in order to administer the program. The remaining funds will be split into two rounds. The first round will be from January 2nd to January 31st, 2019, and 37.5 million will be allocated for that round. The second funding round will run from May 1st to May 30th, 2019, and 60 million or all remaining funds will be allocated for the second round. All program funds must be expended by the board by June 30th, 2021. Any remaining funds after that must be sent back to the general fund. So the office of a, the OPSC proposed this two round system because it will provide school districts additional time to prepare their project submittals if they're not ready uh, for the first submittal round. And we want as many school districts to participate in the program as possible. And it will also help the program funds be expended within the short time frame. And since the program is using funding rounds, the date the application was received by OPSC will not determine funding order. However, applications with original signatures and all necessary documents must be physically received by OPSC on the last day of each funding round. So as spelled out in statute, this program will use the most current SFP or school facility program K through six new construction and modernization grant amounts in order to calculate the amount for this program's new construction and retrofit grant amounts. Excluding school districts that receive financial hardship funding, program grants will be provided on a 50-50 state and local share basis for new construction projects and a 60-40 basis for retrofit projects, the same as an SFP. So who can apply? In order to be eligible to apply, districts must meet the following, recommend, or re the following requirements. The district currently has or will have by project completion a school board resolution providing approval uh, to provide full day kindergarten instruction at the project school site. The district must also currently lack the facilities to adequately provide full day kindergarten instruction for existing pupils at the project school site. So a district will be considered lacking full day kindergarten facilities if the site's kindergarten and TK enrollment based on the most current enrollment data available exceeds the existing kindergarten compliant classroom capacity prior to the construction of the project. 
And compliant classrooms simply refers to classrooms that met Title V requirements at the time of construction. So the SFP loading standard of 25 K through six pupils per classroom will be applied to each classroom in the project, even if there are less than 25 pupils actually loading the project classrooms. So for example, if a school only has 40 kindergarten pupils, they are eligible for two classrooms, uh, which equals to 50 pupil grants. In other words, grants are based on increments of 25 pupils. And to continue uh, uh, eligibility requirements, statute only allows school districts to apply for funding. Therefore, uh, county offices of education, charter schools, joint powers of authority, and the State Department of Education are ineligible, ineligible to apply. However, school districts that provide kindergarten instruction may apply on behalf of a charter school as long as it's located in district-owned facilities. School districts must also hold the title to the real property where the facilities will be located. Therefore, projects located on lease sites are not eligible for funding through this program. So here's an example of a eligible program project. So before the project, the school site has two part-day kindergarten classrooms. The two part-day kindergarten classrooms have 50 pupils in each classroom, 25 in the morning, 25 in the afternoon. In order to provide full-day kindergarten instruction for all pupils at the site, the district would need two new kindergarten classrooms. The need for two classrooms translates to being eligible for 50 pupil grants. After the project, the school would end up with four total full-day kindergarten classrooms with 25 pupils being loaded in each. So type of grants. The two main grants offered in this program are new construction and retrofit grants. New construction grants seek to increase the number of full-day kindergarten classrooms through the construction of new school facilities at an existing school site. Retrofit grants seek to increase the number of full-day kindergarten classroom through the retrofitting of an existing facility that is not already a kindergarten classroom. So if requesting funding for a retrofit project, districts must, uh, must certify that the classroom to be retrofitted did not meet kindergarten design requirements when it was built or uh, that it was not previously retrofitted in order to meet design requirements for kindergarten classrooms. And a few more points that we wanted to uh, make were that the program does not allow for the construction of new portable classrooms. However, it does allow for the retrofitting of existing portables. And finally, retrofit funding is not inclusive of demolition of an entire facility. So to continue, Districts may apply for funding with or without an advanced release of funds. So program grants without an advanced release of funds are for districts that have all the required supporting documentation. And that includes DSA plan approval, CDE final plan approval, and potentially the school board resolution authorizing full day kindergarten instruction to be conducted on the site. Um, although this resolution can be submitted up until uh, the project completion date and new construction or retrofit grants with an advanced release of funds are for school districts that have none or only a portion of the required supporting documentation. So districts doing new construction projects can request advanced funding for design costs, which would be 40% of the base grant, like it is in SFP, um, and they can also request advanced funding for site acquisition costs. And districts doing retrofit projects can request uh, additional advance funding for design costs, which will be 25% of the base grant, like in SFP again. So to uh, sum up my little portion, uh, base grants for both new construction and retrofit projects can be increased by additional grants. So for new construction projects, districts can request additional funding for site acquisition costs, However, the site must be adjacent to the existing facility, and funding will only be provided respective to the land required for the actual proposed project. Uh, districts can also request additional funding for hazardous waste removal, automatic fire detection and alarm system, automatic sprinkler system, site development, which will be 35% increase of the base grant, and this percentage was determined by looking at the overall um, historic average of set SFP site development grants. 
There's also multi-level construction grants, which would be a 12% increase of the base grant, like it is in SFP. And finally, there is the project assistance additional grant, which is for school districts that have an enrollment of 2,500 pupils or less. And then for retrofit projects, districts can request additional funding for an automatic fire detection and alarm system, site development, which again will be the 35% of the base grant. They can request funding for utility costs necessary in order to retrofit a facility that is 50 years or over a permanent building. And this base grant will be, uh, the base grant will be increased for 15% for this additional grant which was also determined by looking at the historic average of SFP 50-year-old utility grants. And then finally, uh, retrofit projects. Uh, districts can request additional funding for project assistance for the smaller school districts. And we are going to be providing site development grants for both new construction and retrofit projects because kindergarten facilities require additional features such as playgrounds, added restrooms, and additional parking and our drop-off areas. So now Joshua Potter will be talking about the application process for our program. Right, thank you. So the application process, uh, all school districts requesting uh, program funding must submit all of the following. Uh, a complete and valid application for funding or form SAB 7001. A site map, uh, with the site map we need to identify and label all current classrooms housing kindergarten pupils. Identify and label all, kindergartner, all kindergarten classrooms that were Title V compliant at the time they were constructed or that were previously um, retrofitted to meet these requirements. Uh, identify any kindergarten classrooms that will not provide full day kindergarten at the completion of the project. Uh, if applying for retrofit funding, identify which facilities the district plans to retrofit. Uh, this is because school districts can still provide part day, uh, but we do need to have that delineation. Uh, identify the classrooms used for either full day or part day kindergarten instruction, including the classrooms that are kindergarten compliant. And indicate the year constructed if applying for the 50-year-old utilities grant. Uh, documentation, verifying district's kindergarten enrollment at the site. Uh, documentation of enrollment may be provided by using the current CBEDS data, uh, registration documents for the school site or classroom attendance rosters. Uh, districts must use the most current enrollment at the time of the application submittal. Also needed is a narrative description of the proposed project. Uh, explain the current kindergarten classroom usage. Explain the district's proposed scope of work in the project plans. Explain the district's planned kindergarten classroom usage at the completion of the, process, of the project. And again, districts may still offer that part day kindergarten instruction, but it would need to be delineated. Uh, continuing, districts applying for new construction grant without an advanced release of funds must submit with their uh, 7001 a DSA application number, DSA final plan approval letter date, CDE final plan approval letter date, plans and specifications, also known as PNS, uh, for the DSA approved project on a CD ROM or a flash drive. CDE final site approval letter, which would be for site acquisition only. Um, appraisal of the property that is less than six months from the date received by OPSC, again for site acquisition only. And a school board resolution approving the full day kindergarten instruction to be provided at the project site. Again, this can be provided at the time of application, but must be submitted by the project completion. Districts applying for a new construction grant with an advanced release of funds for design and or site must submit the following with their 7001. CDE contingent site approval letter and preliminary appraisal of the property that is again less than six months old from the date of receipt by OPSC. Districts applying for a retrofit grant without an advanced release of funds must submit the following with their 7001. DSA application number, DSA plan approval letter date, CDE final plan approval letter date, the plans and specifications, again, on the CD-ROM or flash drive, and identify the age of the buildings on the site map for 50-year-old utilities grants. Um, just a note on that, uh, the effective date for determining the age of a building is one year from the DSA approval date. Districts applying for a retrofit grant with an advanced release of funds for design costs must submit with their 7001 a site map with the identification of the buildings on the site, uh, again, only for the 50-year-old utilities grant. So moving on to completing the application, 
Uh, I will go through a few slides of the 7001 form for a quick overview, uh, as well as go through the financial hardship process, what to expect there, and how to find the free and reduced price meal percentages, or FRPM. All information requested in the header must be provided. Uh, the district must assign a project tracking number, or PTN, to the project. The same PTN is used by OPSC, DSA, and CDE for all project applications submitted to those agencies to track a particular project through the entire review process. If the district has already assigned a PTN to their project uh, prior to the submittal of the plans and specifications to either DSA or CDE, use that PTN for the application. If no PTN has previously been assigned for the project, a PTN may be obtained from OPSC's website. Moving on on the 7001, um, going through the sections, uh, number one would be the type of application. Uh, check the appropriate box that indicates the type of program funding the district is requesting for the purposes of a new construction apportionment with or without advance, uh, or retrofit apportionment with or without advance. Number two, the pupil grant request and project information. Enter the total number of pupil grants assigned to the project using the state loading standard of 25 pupils per classroom. As explained earlier, even if there is not a full 25 that are unhoused, you would still do the increments of 25 when indicating this. Uh, enter the number of new kindergarten classrooms for which the district is requesting funding as shown on the plans and specifications. Enter DSA's application number for this project, if applicable, and again for the DSA final plan approval as well as CDE plan approval, this would be if applicable. Uh, entering the dates, uh, or the, uh, excuse me, the recommended site size, um, usable existing acres and proposed acres would again be uh, if that is available at the time. If the district is requesting site acquisition, enter the dates of the CDE final site approval or CDE contingent site approval. Moving on, number three, the project priority funding order. Enter the priority number of this application in relation to other program applications submitted by the district during the same round. This is where the district has the opportunity to prioritize their projects if multiple applications are, submitting, are submitted in the same funding round. This will come into play if needed uh, if the program is oversubscribed for the filing rounds in determining the funding order. Number four for the preference points. Preference points will be used to determine the order in which districts are funded. Uh, districts with the highest preference points will receive priority funding and funding first. Check the box if the district is requesting financial hardship and or is requesting to receive the preference points for financial hardship because it is unable to meet a portion or all of its required matching share. To receive these preference points, uh, for financial hardship, a district must meet the criteria defined in education code, uh, and project points that meet these criteria will receive 40 preference points for the financial hardship. For number B, the district's free and reduced price school meals, or FRPM, percentage, if the district is requesting to receive priority points for having a high population of pupils who are FRPM eligible. Because a high percentage is required, districts must have at least 60% to receive preference points. The district can earn up to 40, and is based on a sliding scale, which the scale is also in the regulations. So for the financial hardship review process, a brief overview of what to expect when applying. Uh, districts will submit the funding application and check the box for the financial hardship request on the 7001. OPSC will notify the district when the 7001 is scheduled to be processed. Districts will be contacted by the financial hardship team, and they will have 30 days to submit their documents that are requested. Financial hardship approval and funding application will be processed concurrently. The district does not have to have an approved financial hardship review prior to submitting an application during either of the filing rounds. When an application is received requesting financial hardship, the full day kindergarten facilities grant program team will notify our financial hardship review team. Uh, for more specific information on the financial hardship review process, uh, we do have some contact slides at the end that include contacts for the financial hardship program. So to determine your free and reduced lunch numbers, um, accessing CDE's DataQuest webpage by using the web address at the top of the screen. For item number one, level, select district. For item two, subject, select create your own report and click submit. On the next page, uh, select the most current year available for the time frame and type, uh, and type a portion of the district's name into the cell and click submit. You do not have to type the entire school district's name but when we go to the next slide, you'll want to make sure that you're using it uh, accurately to make sure that you have the right school selected. 
Uh, please note again that the most current data at the time of application submittal is required. So on this next screen, uh, you'll click the box next to free or reduced lunch link. Um, don't click the link, just actually click the box. And then sliding down at the bottom of the page, you would um, select the drop down and make sure you have the appropriate school selected. And again, hit submit. The district's percentage will appear in the screen. Uh, for example, we, key, we keyed in Sacramento City Unified and the FRPM is 69.8% as highlighted. So continuing on to the form, um, refer to any regulations for eligibility criteria for all types of program funding, but going through some of these options for number five, new construction additional grant request, check the appropriate boxes if the district requests additional funding for fire detection alarm system, site development costs, multi-level construction, um, list the number of kindergarten classrooms within the multi-level facility as identified in the plan and specifications, project assistance. For new construction additional grant requests, site acquisition, if the school is requesting funding for eligible site acquisition costs, enter the appropriate information, which would include the 50% of the actual cost or 50% of the appraised value. Uh, again, the, appraises, the appraisals would need to be within six months of the application submittal to OPSC. Um, please also note that with site acquisition grant, it would be the lesser of one half of the actual cost of the site or one half of the appraised value of the site. Again, there are a few more options to select, um, which would be dependent on where you're at in the, as far as the project, which could include 50% of the actual relocation cost or 50% of the estimated relocation, which would be in an advance only. 50% uh, of the actual Department of Toxic Substances Control or DTSC fee for review and approval of the phase one environmental site as assessment and preliminary endangerment assessment reports. And then also 15% of the appraised value for DTSC in advance only. Uh, continuing number six uh, would be the 50% of the actual amount allowable for hazardous materials, waste removal, and or remediation, uh, or the 50% of the estimated for an advance, and then of course a box to check if an RA is required. For item number seven, retrofit additional grant request, complete the following sections if the district requests the additional funding for automatic fire detection alarm system, site development, 50-year-old utilities, and project assistance. For item number eight, uh, construction information, check the box that best represents the construction delivery method that the district has or will use for the project if known. Enter the dates the construction contracts were awarded, uh, if there are any at the time. Uh, if a construction contract has not been executed, enter NA. If the space provided is not, an, is not sufficient for all applicable dates, uh, please list all dates on a separate attachment to the form. For item number nine, the architect of record or licensed architect certification. The architect of record or the licensed architect must complete this section if applicable. Again, in advance, they may not have that at the time. Uh, they will provide the DSA approval date and certify that the plans and specifications meet the, required, the requirements of Title 24. Item number 10, uh, architect of record or design professional certification. Again, the architect of record or appropriate design professional must complete this section if applicable, meaning that they do have the plans already ready to go. Uh, they will certify that they have developed a cost estimate of the proposed project and that the estimated construction cost of the work in the plans and specifications is at least 60% of the total grant amount provided by the state and the district's matching share. This is also known as the 60% commensurate. Uh, please note that if you are applying for a grant with advance that you only have to fill out sections nine and 10 if you already have the DSA approval and or you have the licensed architect or architect of record for the project. If neither of these apply to the application being submitted, uh, you may leave them blank. For item number 11, the certification, the district representative must complete this section. Uh, be sure to read all the certifications before you sign the application. And we do want to point out a few of them in particular because there are uh, information that needs to be added to it. Uh, the third bullet in the certification section requires the district representative to insert the date of the school board resolution needed to apply for the program funds. This can also be other types of documentation, not just the resolution. And then another specific certification we wanted to point out is one regarding the required school board resolution that authorizes the district to provide the full day kindergarten instruction. Uh, as you'll see, the, this certification has options. The district can enter whichever one is applicable at the time of the application submittal. Number one being that the full day kindergarten resolution along with their application is being provided. Or 
if they will, uh, will be providing this resolution by project completion and the submittal of their ex uh, expenditure report. Please note that any time revisions for a 7001 are required, uh, it does also include the requirement of having original uh, re-signed signatures of the district representative and the architect of record if the architect of record has been assigned. And now Lindsay will come up and discuss the funding order. Okay, so I will discuss the funding order for the full day kindergarten program. So uh, with preference points, preference points will be used to determine the order in which school districts are funded. Um, they will be given to each application um, with an up to a maximum of 80 points. So 40 points will be given if a school district demonstrates that it meets the requirements for a financial hardship grant. Uh, 40, excuse me, program statute uh, states that preference is given to school districts that cannot provide a portion of or all of the local matching share, um, which is required for the full day kindergarten program. Therefore, a school district that is able to provide the required match um, is not eligible for the 40 preference points. Up to 40 points will be given based on the percentage of pupils who are eligible for the free and reduced price school meals. Um, the percentage will be based on school district data, not school site specific data. The sliding scale is listed in the regulations. So to continue with the funding order, um, there's a possibility of multiple waves of the funding order within each funding round, um, which will be based on the number of application each school district submits. All approved projects will be funded in the determined order until all funds are exhausted for each round. So the first wave of funding order will be decided as follows. Uh, school districts will be funded based on the total preference points. If a school district submits multiple applications in the same funding round, OPSC will use the priority number assigned to each application by the school districts, uh, which is on section three of the 7001. School districts will have their first priority projects funded in order based on total preference points until all school districts have had their uh, first priority project funded. School districts with the same total preference points will be placed into a lottery system to determine which um, school districts will receive funding first. So if sufficient funding remains after the process described in the previous slide, uh, a second wave of funding order will be decided as follows. The school district with the highest total preference points shall have their remaining projects funded by the priority, norm, priority number of their projects. Funding shall then be provided to the next school district with the highest total preference points. Uh, if school districts with multiple applications are tied for preference points, um, they will be placed into a lottery system to determine which uh, school district will be funded first. The highest remaining uh, priority project for each school district participating in the lottery will be funded until all projects from each school district participating have been funded. Uh, a visual of this will be explained in an upcoming slide. If the board does not have sufficient funding to fully apportion a school district's project, the school district may elect to either uh, accept partial funding for their project, and if they accept the partial funding, the apportionment shall become full and final. Now, if a school district chooses to decline uh, partial funding, uh, the board may offer partial funding to the next approved application based on preference order, and if the district declines partial funding, um, they may reapply for a following filing round if applicable. So here's an example um, to further explain the program's funding order. So the following five school districts have applied to the program and all applications were approved for funding. So school districts B, C, and D all have the same total preference points. So they were placed into a lottery system to determine um, the order within the funding wave that will fund each of these school districts first priority projects. So in this example, uh, school district B was picked first, district C was picked second, and D was picked third. Uh, the same order will apply to the subsequent funding wave. So school district A has a total of 75 preference points, but was not placed into a lottery since no other districts were tied uh, for preference points. Districts B, C, and D all have 70 points and have a differing number of approved applications. And then school district E is the final district with 68 preference points, but does not participate in the lottery round because no other district was tied for points. So with the first funding wave, school districts A through E will have their first priority projects funded. Now, assuming that there is a sufficient funding for all approved projects, the funding order will go as follows. School district A will have their remaining two projects funded, and then school district B, C, and D will have their second priority project funded, and then this will complete the funding for all of school district C's projects. Uh, 
Now we move on to fund the third priority projects of districts B and D, and then school districts, uh, school district D's fourth priority project, since district B only had the three projects. Then finally, we will fund school district E's remaining projects. This is just a small example of what program funding um, will look like when there are multiple districts tied for preference points. So fund release and reporting. School districts who receive new construction or retrofit grants uh, without an advance release of funds uh, must submit a valid fund release authorization form, which is uh, form 7002, with all required approvals within 180 days of apportionment. School districts who receive new construction um, or retrofit grants with an advance release of funds uh, must then submit a valid 7002 with all the required approvals within 12 months of the apportionment. You don't need to submit a 7002 for a release of funds only for the full fund release. So because the program is funded from money from the general fund, money is available after the board authorization. Therefore, school districts will not have to participate in the priority and funding uh, process in order to receive their program funds. A grant agreement must be submitted prior to the release of any funds. Uh, all apportionments will result in cash proceedings being available. Uh, grant agreements must be executed by an authorized district representative. Um, if a valid 702 is not received within 180 days or 12 months of the apportionment, the apportionment will be rescinded. So this is a sample program timeline for projects that are not requesting in advance. So first, a school district submits their 701. The uh, OPSC will approve the application and the uh, SAB, so the State Allocation Board, um, approves an apportionment. The school district will then submit a 702 and a grant agreement. And once those have been submitted and approved by OPSC, all funds will be released to the school district. School districts, again, will have 180 days to complete the entire process from apportionment to fund release. So here's an example of a timeline for a project that receives an advanced funding. After the a funding application is received and approved by OPSC, then the application will go to the State Allocation Board to receive an approval for apportionment. If the district is requesting an advance for the design of the project and or site, then they will receive the advance funds after OPSC receive, receives a valid grant agreement. Once the school district is ready for the full fund release, they will submit a valid 7002 and a grant agreement and their funds will be released. The district may submit a 7002 in phases for the release of the remaining funds uh, for site acquisition and then again for construction or site and then construction for the remaining full. Uh, and they may be released concurrently with a single 702 and a corresponding grant agreement. Districts uh, will have one year from the State Allocation Board apportionment to request the full fund release. So for program reporting, um, a school district that receives program funding uh, must submit a valid expenditure report, which is Form 703, at the completion of the project. Projects will be deemed complete either uh, when the notice of completion of the project has been filed or one year from the final fund release. So two 703s will be submitted for, non, for a non-financial hardship district and that has project savings. The first one, the final expenditure report, will be submitted uh, one year from the project completion or the final fund release. Um, the second one, which is the final savings report, will be submitted one year after the submittal of the original expenditure report. A project that received financial hardship grant must return any unexpended funds to the state at the completion of the project. This will also be done on the 7003. So projects will be subject to a local audit conducted to assure that expenditures incurred by the school district were made in accordance with education code and program regulations. Okay, so here is a link to the program website where you can find all of our application forms and regulations. And then we also have a link up for the PTN generator or tracker depending on which one you're using. Um, so our contacts are up here, myself, Alexandra, and Joshua, so you may contact us at any time if you have any questions. Um, and then we also have our two contacts for financial hardship, which is John Leninger, um, with his contact information. And then for audit questions, you may contact Jason Hernandez. Um, for submitting project applications, we also have our OPSC um, address has been provided. Okay, any questions?
Thank you very much. Uh, good presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, we're looking at a project potentially of having um, portable buildings on site uh, which serve uh, full day kindergarten and uh, 50 year old facilities, permanent mm -hmm. facilities that um, house 50 year old, you know, uh, full day kindergarten. Should we combine the application into one application or do you suggest maybe doing two separate applications uh, for retrofit actually? Okay, so the question is um, a circumstance where the site has potentially both project scopes, the new construction as well as the retrofit, and does that require two applications, is that correct? Yes. Uh, one application actually is, is fine on that submittal process. Uh, we can actually process the application in its entirety with just one application. When we provide the, um, the funding shells or the, where the item that actually goes to the board, there will be two separate shells, and that would be to delineate the costs and grants to go there. Uh, and make sure that it's a clear cut for accounting as well as the tracking that we need to do on that. But it can all be done on one application form. Okay, and I'm, I'm assuming one PTN number as well? That's correct. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just one last notice. Uh, on Friday, we did receive notification of the regulations, forms, and grant agreement approval by the Office of Administrative Law. So they are now posted on the website, and links are active and ready to go. Uh, with that, I appreciate the attendance. I uh, hope that everybody gets to enjoy watching the webcast, which will also be posted on the website within a matter of uh, probably a couple of days. Um, please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact any of us for the program team, and thank you.